Hello and welcome to the Empathy Podcast. This podcast seeks to explore the minds of those who not only understand or experience empathy, but of those who wish to take action, build, and practice empathetic behavior through conscious decision and responsible lifestyle choices. So if that sounds like something you might be interested in, this podcast might be just for you. So sit back, relax, and use what you were born with, empathy. All right, hello, and welcome to the Empathy Podcast. Today we're here, we're delighted in the middle of the forest. Um, as some of you guys can see, the ones that are watching on video can see, we're delighted with Cam, and he is from San Diego. He's an animal liberation activist. I'm so blessed to be here in the nature with him. We have the babbling brook, um, <laughs> the stream right behind us. This is a beautiful setting, and San Diego's known for that, um, but we have been ravaged as a state recently by some record-breaking wildfires, which has been super crazy. Uh, so before we get right into the whole meat of the podcast, I have a couple quick questions to ask you before we get started. So the first question for you is, what does empathy mean to you? Yeah, and thanks for having me, Luna. This is a hell of a spot and, and a place that I've been coming to for uh, many years, so it's, it's cool to be here. Um, what does the word empathy mean to me? Well, I think empathy, from like a technical sense, is the ability for... Well, first of all, before that, like we are complex, emotional and, and feeling beings. And with that, we're able to abstract the experiences that people have around us. Um, so I'd probably divide um, that answer into what is sympathy and compassion and what is empathy, um, since they're a little bit different. And sympathy um, is, is more of being able to intellectualize and understand what kind of experience someone might be having. Um, whereas empathy is is actually, you know, to be cliche, is putting your shoes uh, or your feet in their shoes and feeling what they are feeling um, without the lenses of judgment and, um, you know, the layers of, of personal experience and, and, and someone's own lens, um, it's to just fundamentally have the feeling of someone else and understand that. And I think that there's like a, there's a delineation or a scale uh, from sympathy to empathy um, where, you know, we can't be all the time pure in understanding what someone else is going through or what their experience of life is. And it's such a complex uh, dynamic to be, to begin with, to, to just be alive. Um, but, uh, but, 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 to make a kind of long story or answer short, the value of empathy is to understand that there is some context and some experience outside of one's own. Um, and, and if you can kind of step outside of yourself and understand someone else's context and experience of life, um, you actually get a, a better understanding of the world. Yeah, absolutely. I think that that is definitely uh, well said for sure. Put this one on. Yeah. Um, and it's nine nine eight eight six six. Yeah, absolutely. I think that that is is very well said, and I think that a lot of people do have a trouble of distinguishing between sympathy and empathy. And I think that sometimes people even have like another kind of uh, separation between like animals and empathy, sure. and and or human and, and animals, and that they that they could both either experience empathy themselves or vice versa. You know, mm -hmm. they can have empathy for others. You know, and so I mean, you can even say like an animal could have empathy for a human, where they feel like, oh shoot, it looks like you got hurt. You ever seen like a dog whimper? You know, and, and feel or a dog feel sad and like feel like what you're probably going through, um, and they're like they know. You know, and of course we know, like we could see, it's obvious when you look at a dog and you're like, hey, that dog, I think they're in pain. I could feel it. You know, I could, I could imagine the pain they're going through. Cause I remember when, when someone stepped on my fingers, you know, or someone's, you know, when someone steps on their paw or yeah. something. Yeah. And I think a good example is, is just the contagious nature of emotions to begin with. And um, you can have a, a, a dog example or a human example where you, you walk into a different setting or room and someone is, is maybe exuberant or someone is heartbroken and you can sense that. And, um, and, and there's the element of sensing it, but then there's the emotional pull from where you were to kind of match them and, and, and begin to feel the suffering or the joy that someone else is feeling. Yeah, that's a good point. Like you ever hear the saying, misery loves company? Mm. It's yeah. the same idea. People that are miserable, they want to be around other people that are miserable, sure. but also people that are very happy and joyful, like they, they right. seek that and they want to be next to those people that are happy and joyful as well. Or your friends are rich and then you are rich. Your friends are poor and, and, and you're poor. Yeah, um. absolutely. All right. So the next question I have for you is what 
was it like climbing on top of a slaughterhouse inside of downtown Los Angeles um, at Farmer John's because that was a very intense situation. Speaking of doing scary things, especially for the animals, that brings me up today's sponsor of today's podcast. If you, some of you guys don't know, but one of the scariest things that I've been through was suffering from an autoimmune disease and nearly dying. I don't know if you know, but I was fat, sick, and nearly dead. The doctor said I couldn't work out, I couldn't go to work, I lost my fiance, and I definitely couldn't help the animals because I was not in the best health. I needed to help myself. And that's when today's sponsor, the podcast, helped me increase my health, helped me look, feel, and perform my best. And I've been able to help so many more people, so many more animals, and be able to give that to other people. I remember going to activist events, just like Cassie's explaining, just going to rescue animals, going to protest, going to do every single thing that you could imagine. And I see activists struggling to keep up, unable to maintain, losing their health, not being physically capable, running out of breath, having headaches, having these issues, having these challenges that is taking them away from helping the animals. I've even seen worse where people are suffering with diabetes, cancer, and multiple sclerosis, other autoimmune diseases that are taking them away from helping the animals. It doesn't have to be this way. That is exactly why it partners with today's Spawncast is so that you can look, feel, and perform your best. Not only so you can help more animals for the activists out there, but also so that you can show thriving, loving, kind, feeling your best, and that is gonna show through to other people and say, hell yeah, I wanna stop eating animals because I wanna look, feel, and perform my best just like you. And if you're gonna eat vegan food, why not eat the best? Why not eat the highest quality? And today's sponsor, you can get $150 off your first order, which is unbelievable. Check the link in the description. I made a special video of the one that I recommend the most where you can get $150 off and can't wait to hear how you love it. And this one is gonna change your life and you will be able to feel your best, perform your best, look your best, and be able to do more for animals, do more of what you love. I was actually there as well. I was on the ground filming. I remember it very, very vividly because it was only like, what, a couple weeks ago. And I remember um, a truck was pulling up uh, full of pigs mm. in the very back. And I remember um, right after that happened, people were chaining themselves to a, to a gate to enter the slaughterhouse. And then right after that, I remember people on the live stream saying, hey, there's activists inside the slaughterhouse shutting down the line. Right after that, literally in succession, um, there was someone on the roof or two people on the roof um, with smoke um, signals and they were dropping a banner. Uh, and one of those people was you. Can you tell me a little bit about that experience? Yeah, definitely. And, it, and it's, it's funny that it was only two weeks ago because it feels like it was, it was yesterday, but also feels like it was a while ago. Um, but, uh, but uh, you know, more, more like even leading up to that is the, the campaign against Smithfield and, and Farmer John's, which is this huge slaughterhouse that's in downtown LA in a, in a small uh, city called Vernon, um, which is an industrial city. There's this, this Smithfield owned facility and Smithfield is uh, a Chinese owned company. They're the largest exploiter of pigs in the world. On the books they kill, you know, up to 60 million pigs, um, but that doesn't even account for all the pigs that, that aren't uh, uh, finally made into the food system, all the babies that are killed inside of the farms, um, etc. So, you know, in terms of just horror show, one of the worst companies on the planet, that is Smithfield Foods, and they have this plant that's right there in the heart of Los Angeles. Um, and, uh, you know, Direct Action Everywhere has had a campaign um, just kind of exposing the truth about Smithfield for I believe five or six years now um, where activists have been going inside of farms documenting getting virtual reality shots of uh, of, of, of just simply what happens uh, behind the scenes of the of the business and exposing it to the public and, and facing the repercussions in the legal system for doing that um, and I personally have had the experience of, of also being inside of a Smithfield facility and uh, and, and seeing that horror so um, so, so fast forwarding from all of that, uh, we had a vigil where um, a few hundred people came to this facility to uh, bear witness to the pigs, kind of a traditional setting of just giving the pigs water and, and you know, looking at their faces, kind of seeing, seeing the, the, the victimhood in, in person. Um, and uh, we've, we've attuned to the fact that at this point, that's not enough. That just watching folks die day after day, you know, for, for years, uh, almost a century now, actually, this place has, has been in existence, um, you know, it's not enough. 
um, we're not doing anything and everyone's really comfortable with us bearing witness. So it's time to do something that kind of shakes the waters and say, says both to the public, but also to the, um, to the corporation that, you know, our end goal is to shut this place down and expose it um, or shut it down through exposure maybe. So, um, so me and a friend, Nico, we started the action on uh, two Mondays ago uh, at night and we uh, climbed a th uh, the exterior of a three-story slaughterhouse. And um, this, this place is known to be kind of like a fortress, kind of like the hardest place to get inside of, get on top of, uh, in addition to it being a, a totally locked down weekend um, with armed guards and extra security since they knew we were there. Um, but we found a spot and were able to use some of our, our love of climbing to, um, to, to basically scale up um, three stories. And, um, you know, it was definitely a little bit of luck and a little bit of, I guess, architectural luck that we were able to get up there. Um, going into it, I didn't know if we'd be able to make it. I didn't know if by the time we got up there, there'd be guards waiting for us on the top. I didn't know if we'd be spotted right away and uh, we'd only have 30 seconds to drop this huge 40 foot banner. Um, but as it turned out, we got up there and we're rushing and then we got a little more calm and it seemed like maybe no one had seen us and maybe we're actually safe to take our time up here um, and that's what we did so we, we got up there we we're comfortable and we dropped a huge right to rescue banner which is a legislative ask that we have for the whole world but mainly california right now um, we dropped it underneath a light on the side of the building where there's this um, very uh, uh, illustrious and deceptive mural of pigs that are you know in these beautiful pastures um, despite the fact that behind those walls there's you know vats of boiling water where their bodies are put into um, and we dropped the banner and kind of the most excitement that I had at that point was hearing on the radio um, everyone get over to this part of Vernon Street and then I could see everyone hustling over and I could see the expression and the tone of voice of, of the folks down there that didn't know what was happening, that were so moved uh, by the unexpected action that we were taking. And um, even in the course of just a couple minutes, I could see so many people lit up and excited about the movement that we're a part of and about the fact that we're taking action. Yeah, I think because I was on the ground um, at that moment and I was, I was filming and I remember thinking there's a lot happening at one time. Um, at one because it felt like all at once because um, sure. I remember it was a very quiet time mm. uh, for like a day and a half uh, because they were really we really kind of stopped the business for like a day and a half as mm -hmm. far as their main part of their business is killing animals um, innocent animals and we slowed down that part and and I remember the energy and the atmosphere that everyone was feeling and I remember um, trying to get the right good shots and good footage you know what's mm -hmm. going on and it's dark and you have this this light up top you know and thinking like where's my zoom in camera you know and my zoom in lens and like all these different things because it was it was really unexpected um, and I felt like a lot of people at the time I think were thinking you know uh, we're making an impact you know we're making a difference and and every time I talk to people about you know whether it's direct action everywhere or whether it's any kind of you know group that is fighting like this, most of the time they feel like this is very effective. This is making a difference. Mm -hmm. This is making an impact. And I think that that's exactly how you described it, where, where when you're watching the victims, um, you know, day in and day out, you know, it, it is just bearing witness, yeah. you know, and when and taking action is a little bit different. And so when we, when taking action like that, um, it does make people feel like there is an impact and when we are making a difference. And I think that is the appeal and the draw um, to organizations like Direct Action Everywhere, uh, for sure. So speaking of uh, direct action everywhere, um, why do you think nonviolent direct action is so effective at making social change? But yeah, that's a good question. Uh, and I think that, you know, I'll kind of jump back to the first question of, of what is empathy? Um, and we were talking a little bit about the, the variance between, you know, the sorts of ways that we can understand other, other emotions and the ways that we affect others. Um, and if we are to, continue down the train of empathy for what happens to anyone uh, but but in this circumstance um, non-human animals pigs specifically um, continue down the path of empathy uh, we actually feel a whole lot of pain and suffering ourselves because that's what they're feeling we feel you know in, in similar ways tortured um, by the fact that this is what's happening on this planet and I think um, a lot of people that have changed their consumer behaviors to not participate in these um, industries that exploit animals 
you know, maybe maybe some feel like they're complete by changing their behavior, but but a lot, I think, and, and I felt this way, feel silenced um, about what uh, is really an epiphany uh, about the world and the way that uh, the world works and the, these businesses work, yet there isn't a place and a platform to express that frustration and express that sadness and grief and anger. And what we do is we just kind of talk it away and culture still oppresses us and suppresses our voice to, you know, say that, well, we shouldn't be pushy upon others and, um, you know, you, you know, you, you effectively you just can't push others. And um, what direct action does is it, first of all, addresses the fact that there is tension um, that lives underneath the surface. And um, this atrocity and the pain exists and it's just washed over and, 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 and cleanly pre presented um, to the public. And as long as that stays the normal, you know, and, and, and on top of that, you add billions of marketing dollars and a culture that is, you know, indoctrinated to basically support the status quo and the way of life because of the way that they've been taught and educated by billion dollar corporations and their, you know, the past generation of that. Um, you know, as long as people's voices are suppressed and silenced and everyone is just trying to be polite all the time, um, that oppression won't come to light. Um, the only way it's going to come is if the status quo is disrupted and, um, and, and people get frustrated because people speak up. Um, and that's what direct action does. So direct action isn't just changing yourself, but it's speaking up and finding a authentic, nonviolent, but unapologetic voice consistently. And I think that's that, you know, I think you also asked a little bit about the organization Direct Action Everywhere, and that's one reason why I have resonated strongly with working with them, um, is I found that it's a group that's the most um, consistent, um, yet malleable, in terms of being able to speak um, fluently and honestly about a subject that we all suffer so much about. Yeah, absolutely. And do you think that uh, there has been situations in the past that we can draw to sure. where we have seen like this does work? Like, are there situations in the past that you know that like, hey, you know, direct action does work. It worked in this situation and maybe yeah. it could work again in this situation. Sure. And without even pointing to any specific oppressions um, and injustices in the past, I think we can all probably um, just think that if there was ever a time when and uh, oppression and uh, a normalized violence was so widespread across uh, a region or country or whatever, there wasn't a lot of tension. It existed because it was profitable for businesses and it, there was an incentive to do so and there wasn't enough voice to, uh, to, to forego it. It seemed normal, natural, and necessary at the time, right? Yeah, and there was always dissenters. There was always, you know, advocates against against whatever form of, of past historical violence that we can talk about. Um, and, you know, in that mix, you have individuals and corporations that are so vested in continuing their business behind closed doors and keeping a mass general public that is compliant in what is, you know, culturally normal at that point in time um, that you know those vested interests aren't 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 wanting they're not going to easily go they're not going to say oh you know what you made a really good moral point and I think we're going to probably pack up our bags maybe file for a chapter 13 real quick and then you know head out of here and, and start making you know soy nuggets or something like that that's just it's not the way the world works it's not the way that it's ever worked um, it's taken mass amount of people that are uh, confident that they have a, uh, a better moral understanding of what's possible and they, um, they, they create havoc so that the world um, can ultimately make up their mind if they want to continue with the way something's been done or if they want to choose something different and oppose an oppression. In a lot of situations, there's a solution. So like, we, sure. let's say you identify a problem or you identify an oppression or you identify that something that, that needs to change socially. Yeah. You know, like what, what we're talking about is what, there are solutions. There are solutions to these things. Uh, and for even, for example, if you go back to the, the case for the slaughterhouse, you know, a lot of people were talking to, to me online like, well, what are you doing for the people? What are you doing for the workers? What sure. are you doing for how are they going to have jobs? You know, how would you answer that? Um, and what, what are some of the things that we did do in that situation? 
Yeah, I mean, um, with any sort of like pivot in culture, you obviously have logistics that have to change. And, um, uh, you know, the argument is that the suffering that would be imposed by people having to change their jobs um, and maybe even a company going bankrupt is trumped by the suffering that happens through the normal activities of this business. Um, so, um, I mean, your question was about solutions, so. Because when we were there, there yeah. were things that we did to help the workers. And what were some, oh, things, sure. some of the outreach and some of the, some of the food and some of the water and some of the education? Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. so I mean, one, one offering that we had was um, providing a resource for uh, the roughly 2,000 people that work at Farmer John's to have an anonymous place where they can safely uh, report any kind of worker or animal abuse that they experience or that they see. Um, and that's a resource that's just not provided by corporate. It's not a resource that's provided by their union to the same extent as, as we will provide. Um, and it's it's a place for them to express their concerns in a safe manner and, and um, you know ultimately dictate what is done with that information. So that was something that we, we um, adamantly advocated for um, and continue to advocate for. Um, on the other side, like like to maybe even be a little bit of a devil's advocate to myself, is that we don't have jobs that we can give 1,800 people. You know, I'm an unpaid activist, and all 200 of us, for the most part, you know, are, are, are losing money to, to show up there. Um, it's not like we can go and, and help other people. But what I have seen is that the determination by the animal rights movement is is like kind of unmatched. In that, if there's a if there's someone who says I'm 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 putting up my boots today, I'm you know, putting my apron down, um, that there would be people that step up um, in the essence of community to help that person find a job. Um, and there are groups out there, um, and there is also, you know, people's, people's free will to go and just find a job that isn't stabbing animals in the throat. Yeah, of course. I mean, even when I look to my, my past, you know, when I, when I first made this decision to stop harming animals, I was working in a place of violence, you know, where there was, mm. there was normalized violence. It was in a restaurant industry, yeah. right? And so I had to make a decision at some point, say, this doesn't, this doesn't align with who I am. Sure. You know, the, the person that I am now doesn't align with, with this business that I had chose to work for in the past. So I just simply said, I'll work somewhere else. Mm. You know what I mean? And I can understand that that might be hard for some people, and it was hard for me at the time. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I felt like, you know, what others are going through and my moral baseline was, that, was a lot stronger than, than the challenges that I might have had, you know, going forward, right? And everyone has their own, their own story and their own totally. situation, you know what I mean? Um, but I think that, that that is an option, you know, it totally is an option, like you said, like the free will. Right. Yeah, so let's go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, and, and let me oh, sorry, sorry, let me let me, let me add like to that point a little bit more. Like, if we want to talk about um, just like the the advances of, of um, what's the word? Um, what technology? Not not technology, but but I guess technology in the energy sector, right? If we want to talk about advances in the energy sector, um, you know, we should be running at a million miles per hour to get people out of coal plants and setting up you know solar panels, you know, across like across deserts basically like like and on people's homes like this is this is an emer like that's another emergency and that's something that should be you know urgently done um, and we shouldn't be worried about the business owners of these coal plants like that's not that's not a priority the same way with the companies that are drilling and fracking all over the world we shouldn't be worried about them continuing to just exist and survive. We should be running together and, and, and doing you know, something that in the, in the line of renewable energy. And the technology's there, resources are there, but the politics um, aren't. And the culture isn't. So um, that's why you know, even though we have a, a climate crisis um, and you have a general public that's against um, you know, uh, oil and gas uh, as a whole, we have an incredibly, you know, slow pace of, of moving towards new things. So, so it's not just animal agriculture specific. It's like any time you pivot from one job or one set, one industry and, you, and there's a, like a moral need to, to pivot to another, it's going to cause some difficulties. Um, but if people agree to the morals and we're guided by doing the right thing and, uh, and just a basic understanding of science, um, that's like the most efficient way to get there. Yeah, a lot of that comes from like the convenience factor, right? It's just more convenient to use oil than a renewable energy, or it's more convenient to use 
Amazon versus, you know, go to like a, a local shop, you know, like these, these, some, ways, these yeah. some of these industries become like so convenient, so easy for some of us that, sure. that it becomes harder, you know, for them to get to make that switch, yeah. you know? Um, and so, yeah, it becomes like that conscious and the education and all those sort of pieces. Right. Yeah. That they go into it, but also the politics and the laws, you know, it's, it's, yeah. it's a lot of factors, right? Right. Uh, and so, yeah. So tell us a little bit more about you. Um, so let's see, I live in San Diego, California. I've lived here for most of my life, but I've traveled a decent amount um, throughout the, the country and a little bit out of country as well. Um, I love traveling. I'm definitely someone who's like, wants to kind of always be on the move, yet haven't done the best job maybe doing that in my life. Um, I want to continue doing that. Um, you know, in a perfect life for me, I'd probably just, you know, do a lot of travel for both animal rights and also maybe food. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, let's see, I'm, I'm into just like movement and stuff. I've done a lot of things like yoga and other fitness sort of things, mountain biking and stuff like that. Um, that definitely brings me a lot of joy. Um, being with animals brings me a lot of joy, um, as well as, as, as working too, and um, you know, both for myself and also for, for the animal rights movement. Yeah, absolutely. So at some point, like a lot of us, we, we noticed the animal cruelty uh, mm -hmm. within the industries. We noticed it maybe within clothing or maybe within food or different areas, you know, yeah. of these cruelty. At what point in your life were you like, I don't want to support that anymore. Like, I'm, I'm going to put that behind me. And how did, how did you get there as well? Yeah, I mean, for everyone, it's like this journey kind of thing. Um, and uh, a couple like distinct little things stick out for me. And I remember cooking with, I, I would always cook with my mom. So we'd always just be in the kitchen and have, I'd be on the chair and I'd, you know, she'd give me the big knife even as a young kid. <laughs> and, um, you know, we'd cook a lot. And, and thankfully I was in a family that didn't, you know, cook bodies too often. Um, but whenever we did have flesh in the kitchen, I felt really uncomfortable with it. And I can distinctly remember uh, seeing like the thighs of chickens and being like, I I'm gonna be an adult someday and have to touch that. And I felt really like, I don't wanna grow up in that way. Like that was a thought of me as like an eight year old, you know, like I don't wanna grow up and do that. Um, you know, and that, that, that thought kinda of just, just sat there for a little while. And um, I started to learn more and more about health, um, watched a few documentaries and um, was somewhat persuaded by um, the humane labeling that's on products and um, you know, it took me it took me a couple years to shift um, towards like all of the the humane label products, which means I was really just giving more money to the industry because these products are more expensive. Um, but then, when I was 15, I took a challenge for my English class to uh, to give up something for two weeks and then write an essay about it. So I was like, okay, I'll give up meat, and I was like this was really easy after two weeks and I, and I already had some understanding of like the ethics side of it and the health side of it so I just stuck and I stopped eating animals when I was 15 um, their bodies and then it was a slow trick because no one no one in high school for me was vegan that I knew of um, or even like vegetarian, vegetarian. Uh, eaters so it was like a slow trickle for me um, but by the time I was about 18 I uh, finally like agreed with myself that there's, um, oh, actually, let me, let me, let me back check for a second. This was, this was funny, um, because I, I, I went vegetarian and I cut down everything and I was good with cutting down everything, like, like everything. I was like, I'm, I'm only going to eat farmer's market eggs. I had this, this idea that they were great. And, um, I was walking down the high, uh, the coast highway one day and there was a lady handing out pamphlets about veganism. And I looked at her and I was like, I'm vegetarian and I do enough. Something like that. I totally scoffed it off. And I, I remember that distinctly. Um, but here I am. <laughs> I guess that's the point of that. Um, no, it was a slow trickle for me. To... You know, someone that I was listening to their story, uh, you know, Nime Delgado, the yeah. bodybuilder, uh -huh. he had the same story. He was yeah, walking yeah. down, he was already vegetarian his whole life, yeah, yeah. And, he w and he had someone talking about veganism, and then he's like, I already do enough, I'm good enough, you yeah, know, yeah, like, yeah. kind of like, you know, leave me alone, I'm on your side kind of thing. Yeah, I right. remember. Right, yeah. right. And it's like, I, you know what, I've studied this thing, and I've come up with the idea that these, like, free-range, you know, bullshit products are, are acceptable, eh? like, like, like. I know a little bit, and um, you have this false sense of confidence about about understanding the subject. Um, but anyway, I like I started to learn more and more and more uh, about everything, and I started just watching more. Like like online online content was really important for me, um, and then I, I finally like cut out everything, 
and took a stance against like um, leather and all the other kind of like byproducts that aren't consumable when I was around 17 or 18. I don't remember. And that was including eggs as well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was yeah, at the finally, same time? Finally cut it off, yes. It was about the same time? About yeah. the same time, yeah. And yeah. then how do you feel like, because 17 is obviously, you were still in high school at this time? It was like the end of high school. The end I of high school? Off, yeah. Yeah, so did you feel like at the time it was challenging from like a social perspective? Because that's usually one of the common things that people do struggle with. It's like, my yeah. friends are kind of not accepting or they don't understand it or my family sure. you know we're like when we can't eat together anymore like there's a lot of like this social friction that happens did you experience some of that stuff yeah that's a good question um the social friction that um occurred then and, and i guess kind of continues now i was never tempted to like eat animal products to please anyone but i was really frustrated to have friends predominantly because my family's vegan um now uh, predominantly friends that weren't as captured by the new information that I was learning as I was. And I didn't have people that were like, wow, this is horrible. We're going to run into this new, like, different lifestyle with you. Um, and that was confusing for me. Um, and I feel like I started to kind of dissent a little bit from uh, the, the, the high school culture that I was a part of. I was less into drinking, less into any kind of like partying. Like I didn't feel like I got a lot out of the social situations that I'd find myself in and, um, you know, cared more about justice and, and, and moral issues and less about like what I'm going to do in my life to get more ahead, more ahead, more ahead. Um, and this is also a time when everyone's trying to get to like the best Ivy League school, right? And I was, I was starting to get less interested in that and more interested about well, what can I do to just be a good person? You know, like I, I um, and I didn't feel like uh, most people were interested in following that same path, and I got pretty frustrated. Um, I just got frustrated and angry with, um, like maybe internally angry with the world, or I internally angry with some people I was close with. Um, and uh, yeah, so that was that was challenging, and that is something that by no means has gone away. Um, it's changed, but it's definitely something that I think a lot of folks feel is. Um, you know, your friends are, are running the machine yeah. of, of suffering in some ways. And, uh, and how, do you, how do you interact with those dynamics? Yeah, absolutely. And it is kind of interesting because I felt like when I went through those same situations, I felt like I might have lost a few friends, but then I kind of thought, like, how much friends were they that, you know, to begin with, if, they, if right. they're not going to accept who I am now, sure. you know, or it's going to, you want to have like a battle about it, right? Yeah. And then... On the flip side, I feel like I gained way more friends, like new friends all over the world now totally. uh, that I would have never encountered with or talked to. And they have such unique mindsets. It's not that like a new friend is like not harming animals. It's like that new friend also has these really interesting perspectives about the government or really interesting sure. perspectives about intersectionality, like or really interesting perspectives on all these different things that I'm like, whoa, yeah. you're so interesting to learn from. You know, not just because of you don't eat animals, right? right? Or you don't harm animals. You know what I mean? Like, you know, it was so interesting. And I think something like, I think there's a lot of activists and like, uh, especially like younger people, um, I think, maybe not, but uh, that, that want to see the world change and want to see like the, the systems and structures of, of our politics and economics change. And, um, and we aren't seeing that pretty clearly, um, at least to the scale that we want. Um, but people do that on an individual level with um, going vegan or becoming anti-speciesist or whatever in that they grew up understanding something about the world and had to completely rewire everything um, and change their voice, change their consumption, um, change their thinking. And that's a powerful thing for individuals to do. And um, I think that that in some sense, you know, could be kind of um, uh, just continued forward to change culture as a whole in, in, in like some sense it could be like like an awakening for us to, to, to change bigger structures um, by having individuals you know very like deeply reanalyze the ways that they they were uh, brought up and, and whatnot yeah absolutely I always say like when someone hasn't seen me in a while and they're like yeah. man Kevin you changed so much you know what I say like they say in like this kind of like weird Thank like you. tone yeah Thank you. Oh my gosh, I've been working so hard. Uh -huh. I've been working so hard to change who I was before. You know, like yeah. I'm so happy now <laughs> that I have that you can see it. You know, because and it is a perspective, right? Yeah. You know, and I and I know it, and I accept it, and I embrace it. Like right. I embrace the different. Like I want to be different. I like I was telling someone, I don't want to be like everybody else. Yeah. You know, kind of thing. 
Um, so I do embrace that. Yeah, absolutely. So then I think a lot of us get to a point, and for me it was six months in after I after I realized kind of the the inherent cruelty and kind of like the systems going on um, within animals. Then I was like, well, six months in, I said I want to help others see this, or I want to help others put an end to this, or I want to help make a change. Yeah. Um, and everyone has their own route and their own reasons. What are some of the reasons that led you to want to make a change um, for others, right? Um, and essentially be an activist. And what kind of things do you do to be active, would you say? Yeah, I think I'm, I'm you know, an activist where like, I just speak up about the subject. Yeah, yeah. Essentially, and what yeah, are yeah. you doing? Yeah. Like, so this is more to encourage gotcha. people. You know, I, I've become more and more active. Um, in some ways, less is a choice. Um, you know, it feels like I kind of have to in some ways because it fills my mind. It occupies my thoughts a lot of the time. Um, you know, I, I'm in a personal space where I can't go to a grocery store or go to a, a dinner or whatever and not be, be thinking about the victims that are around me. I can't sometimes sleep because I'm thinking about the things that I've witnessed and experienced or, or, or know is happening. And um, in some ways, the antidote to that pain, not that it necessarily works, but, but one antidote to the pain is to do something about it. And um, yeah, I, I think it becomes less of a choice. It becomes something that you just, you have to do. And like, you know, their suffering exists and, and therefore my suffering exists. Um, so I'm going to be, be working for both of us. And did this happen like early on, like 17 age, mm. or did this happen later on? It's capitulated, you know, as I've gotten older. Mm -hmm. um, my like predominant form of activism when I was younger, when I didn't have a, a community of, of bold and outspoken people around me, was to do a lot of potlucks and, and bring it up. Um, but I was one person doing that and, and always a little bit kind of like, Oh, he's the annoying, loud vegan person, and um, you know. So, so, so I, 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 I quelled my voice, um, but um, yeah, I guess, I guess I, um, once I found like a little more financial independence, a little more confidence from breaking away from other the uh, some of the other like just social establishments I'm not super comfortable with, um, is when I have um, been able to like just experiment with speaking up more and. Uh, definitely you know feel feel more aligned doing so and what would you say are some of the things that you do to be active like in in your lifestyle what, what would you say that is well sometimes I'll climb on top of slaughterhouses <laughs> yeah. and drop big banners and go to jail for that <laughs> um, that's like a really easy thing anyone can do kind of <laughs> I'm just kidding um, I don't know I guess like uh, like like simple things for just personal empowerment is talking about it when you see it. So I don't always do this, it depends on my mood, but like simple things like you go to a grocery store and you see someone buying something and you just talk to them and you're like, hi, um, and I've challenged myself with this and it's like, hi, like seeing that, um, that chicken that's in a carton makes me really sad. Can I give you a little bit of information about it? And um, I'm doing it for me kind of because it makes me sad and because I think that animal would want like someone to have done something for them. And even though it's too late, I'm going to do something. So I try to practice my voice doing things like that. Um, we also hold some kind of like outreach things and that's pretty like global where people just hold televisions in public spaces and talk to the general public about um, footage that's shown on the screen of, uh, of animal exploitation that's endemic in our culture. Um, uh, we've also, or I've, I've uh, experimented a little bit with investigatory work as well going yeah. inside of factory farms and uh, doing it with a camera and trying to get some uh, something that I think would uh, be impactful for, for folks to see. So um, there's definitely a scale of things. Oh, and then also just like, just it's simple, but, but emailing relentlessly like local uh, politicians and local businesses. And I probably spend an hour or two, maybe two hours a week, and I've done that for a year, just emailing politicians locally and emailing local businesses and just giving them either information or, or, or direct asks of what I'd like. And uh, for the most part, not much has happened. We've had, we've had little, little changes in, in our San Diego um, uh, uh, policies, um, uh, local, local um, guidelines. But uh, yeah, just, just trying to elevate the fact that this is a subject that people should be concerned about. 
And then how do you feel like when you're, when you're being active, how do you feel like some people handle it? Like some of the conversations that you have with people, um, do you feel like most people are accepting or willing to, to make some of these changes, especially when you see like, let's say you see it on a, on a TV and then you talk about it, you know what I mean? Yeah. Or, you're, or you're making some kind of disruption, be like, hey, what's going on here? Like, why is this, why is this place of business, you know, being targeted? Yeah. You know, do you feel like some people are, are receptive to that? Or how do you feel like some of the changes are being made on an individual level? I feel like people are either receptive or, um, or they're suffering <laughs> because they are, are, are just choosing to stay so staunch to um, a system that they, they've just taken for granted is the only option. Um, so no, not everyone's receptive for sure. And um, in some ways I actually like people that aren't receptive and I like the fact that there's people that exist that, exist that are really vocally against um, kindness towards animals um, because I think it's, it's really good contrast for the people that are receptive to see that there's very balanced and logical people talking about not confining and mass torturing 80 billion animals every year and then you have another group of people that are just totally mesmerized by the gustatory pleasure they have of, of eating someone's body and they you know will probably say some pretty awful things and given the choice the people that are receptive I think will you know it's it's a clear side for them to stand on um, and that's all we need we don't need everyone to, to jump on board we just need more people and um, that's what it takes I think to change the world yeah, I had one activist that said recently, like, you don't need everybody to, like, stop eating animals or stop harming animals, essentially. You just need a select few, right, a, a select number of few that are taking action yeah. and making that difference. And you think know? about this. All the people that, um, that support the exploit of animals do that because it's a system that they were born into. And if we have all the other people that are receptive, you know, work on changing the system and, 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 uh, and enacting new laws and a new culture, you know, these people are the follower type of people to begin with. And uh, maybe not with them, the but, but it might be the generation after ours that, um, you know, they follow, but they follow in a, in a much more... In just a new system. Yeah, a new, better, better system. Yeah. yeah, better world. Absolutely. So would you say, is there anything else that maybe as we wrap this up that you want to leave the audience with, like maybe one big thing? Um, one big thing. Or something important that maybe we didn't talk about? Um, it's important to you. I guess what's important to me is, um, okay, well, I'll go back to the text you sent me earlier about, <laughs> um, about how I, what I call myself and if I call myself an activist or not, because I think that's an interesting okay, point. Sure, yeah. And I, um, I'm not sure if I even call myself an activist, even though I'm not opposed to that uh, defining term. I just think that um, I kind of feel like I live life like the way that I should. It's like given you know, the opportunities and, uh, and, and place in life that I have, I have time and resources to be able to um, speak up for folks that are uh, in, in worse situations. And I think that that's just what everyone should do. You know, I don't think that, um, that, that we're going to get anywhere if, if people are, you know, so focused on themselves and so focused on the next house and the next, you know, million dollars or whatever. I just, I just, I don't know, our, our world's not going to go very far um, in this or the next, you know, couple generations. So it's just, you know, use your time is in your voice are the most powerful things that that you have and um, and use it for what you care about and support other justice movements uh, and be an example for for people to be open-minded uh, just you know listening because it's the same way when we went vegan what it took is for us to listen be open to a new perspective so just keep that tap open you know be discerning but listen and try to understand um, and move the, the world forward that way. Yeah, I just posted something recently that said something very similar. It's like the best form of activism is like being yourself and being like a really good person, you know, kind of thing. Like it's really simple, yeah. you know, something along those lines. It's just yeah. so basic and like really I'd, And I'd also say like probably um, another like worthwhile point to say is that, um, you know, for like the people that are just like curious about, you know, changing their, their diet and stuff like that, um, changing your diet is, is like the easiest thing you can do it really is um, super easy I think like anywhere you live um, if, if you do it because you, you, you care about a certain set of values um, the difficulty comes over time when um, it's less about your changes that you have to go through in your behavior but it's about the fact that the reason you changed 
um, still exists in the world. And the pain and maybe the sadness that you'll probably have to live with, um, hopefully not forever, um, you know, knowing that even though you're not directly contributing to the suffering, it's happening everywhere at libido. Yeah, absolutely. For that's, sure. that's tough. That's tough as shit. It's not, it's not changing your diet that's tough. It's, it's like waking up. Yeah. Well, with that, where can people find you if they want to follow you? Uh, maybe follow your Instagram or any, any places like that? Yeah, I like put half-ass effort into my Instagram, which is at Kameta, C-A-M-M-E-H-T-A. All right, great. And I'd also follow Direct Action Everywhere on Instagram and especially Facebook. Direct yeah. Action Everywhere. All right, absolutely. Well, thank you so much for your time. Yeah. Um, and let's have some fun in the, in the lake. Time to go swimming. In the river. <laughs> <Kind of swimming. laughs> Anyways, yeah, we'll take care and uh, we'll be seeing you soon. Yeah, thank you, Luna. Thank you guys for listening to the podcast. Please, please, please make sure that you guys share this with anyone that you think will find this interesting. And also make sure that you guys subscribe because I can see a lot of you guys are listening, but you aren't subscribed. 